Hey everybody, so glad you're here. I can't believe it's the final week of our teaching together. I've enjoyed so much the live sessions where we've got to interact. Um, even though at times we had some te technical difficulties, everybody pushed through, did a great job. Thank you for participating in um, the questions and reading the books and um, you know uh, communicating back and forth with me and all that. Um, we've had so many great testimonies. One of the great things I've heard this week is people that for the very first time uh, begin to pray for the sick. And a lot of people um, saw great results. There are people that for the first time in their life went out and began praying for the sick. A uh, family that was from Vietnam, a young girl that we'd spoke about before um, on, I'll just mention her because she's talked about it uh, live in our discussion. Um, there was like 10 family members that were sick and, um, and she has begun to realize, she used to think it, it was God's will to bring sickness, but now she knows it's God's will to heal. And she's begun to stand in faith and, uh, and bring healing. Others um, that are part of our class, that, that one lady said that she, uh, I think it might have been Penny, who went and prayed for a bunch of people with neck and back problems this week and, and that God healed. And others um, that boldly begin, one, one uh, uh, couple of ladies begin to minister to someone with cancer who's at the very last leg with their cancer. And uh, they stepped right out in faith, and they're getting in the Word of God with her, beginning to teach her. And uh, one of the biggest things, because we've spent the last um, six sessions, three weeks, but six sessions, talking about uh, what the Scripture says about God's will to heal, about divine healing in the atonement, um, about ways to receive healing, things that will hinder you from receiving healing. We've looked at all that, but uh, a lot of people have been asking the question, um, because this is not a comprehensive class. There's no way to get into everything. But a lot of people have been asked the question of how to minister to the sick. Um, and so we're going to deal with that uh, a lot tonight and uh, of how to minister to the sick. Um, and in other words, how to take what you've learned about healing. Now, as we do this, we're still going to be learning about healing itself, uh, things that maybe you haven't heard before. As we talk about ministering to the sick, this is something that I've done my entire life. Um, there are pictures of me laying hands on my grandmother at age two. Um, every time she would get a headache, she would come over. I would lay hands on her. The headache would go away. Um, and, uh, and I was laying hands on the sick as, uh, as early as I can remember. Um, was baptized in the Holy Spirit and spoke with tongues at age five. And uh, had visions of Jesus um, in, my, in my life. For two years, Jesus appeared to me in my dreams and uh, told me a lot of things and, and, and told me stories from the Bible I'd never heard before. Uh, ultimately gave me a vision of hell and, uh, and about my ministry that now today it's beginning to be fulfilled. Um, and so, you know, um, in my whole life I've dealt with the supernatural, but many of you, this is something brand new for you. And I really want to help you, um, and I want to recap some of what we've been learning as we begin to talk about how to minister to the sick. Um, you know, I have uh, uh, been blessed to see a blind, totally blind woman healed, totally deaf person healed, um, uh, multiple people who could not walk healed. Um, one man had not walked for 10 years, one lady for four years. Um, and there's someone we're ministering to right now uh, who's got, who's a total quadriplegic from the neck down. She's beginning to get movement now um, uh, in her arms and, and in her fingers. And uh, even her leg uh, has jumped and moved several times. And so God's doing a work in her. Um, and uh, as you'll hear, you know, sometimes, as you heard last week, we talked about different ways to receive healing, that gradual healing is one of the ways, like a seed that's planted. But just to kind of recap where we've been, um, you know, God is willing. We learned the very first week, God is willing. And we saw the proof that God's desire was to heal, uh, mainly in the life of Jesus, that he's the express image of the will of God. And when we look at Jesus, we know God's will. Never once did he say, here, I'm putting sickness on you because I want you to learn something. You know, I'm going to punish you with this sickness or whatever. Jesus was always removing the sicknesses. We learned that demon spirits were named after um, uh, illnesses, or maybe the illnesses were named after the demons. Either way, uh, they were always associated with evil. Sickness is just a, another form of death. And so it, it was God's mortal enemy, sickness is. 
And so, therefore, it, God's will has to be healing. It can't be sickness and death. We talked about the, the history of divine healing. The fact that, you know what, they not only did they teach it in the Gospels, and they even taught it all through the book of Acts, uh, not only would you see teaching even beyond that in the book of James and other places we learn about divine healing, uh, but uh, in the first century, second century, third century, church fathers taught on healing. During the dark ages, we don't hear much about anything, including salvation by faith. Not very, very many people really stood on that. But then we see as the Reformation comes, there are some sprinkles of healing be being taught there, especially begin to come in in the 1700s. And then in the 1800s, wow, they really begin to get a hold of divine healing. And um, it's not a coincidence, I think, that uh, some of them um, lived to be very old in a time when the average person only lived to be 55. Some of them, like Andrew Murray, when the average person died at 55, he lived to be 88. Um, some others, like John G. Lake, that we've spoken a lot about, um, John G. Lake lived to only be 65, but it was in a time when the average age of the person was 55, and it was beyond any comprehension that he would have lived that long at that time. Um, and he was living in a time, by the way, he, he, didn't, he was a little radical. He didn't believe in taking medicine at all. And so when people would come to his healing houses, they weren't allowed to bring their medicine in. Um, they weren't allowed any kind of medical care. It was a very radical approach that we don't say you should do, but, uh, but we still bring up the fact that he did that. So we talked about the healing, um, the history, and there's a lot of things. Um, you can see optional videos when you look on Synergy. We put like 12 videos. Um, some of those videos tell the truth about the Word of Faith movement, the real Word of Faith versus the false. I put several um, things from uh, Rod Saunders on there. You can look in case you take T.L. Osborne and you say, oh, I don't believe in that teaching or I don't believe in what you're saying because that just that word of faith stuff is false doctrine because you heard some stuff by some people that actually at, at times told lies, um, didn't even tell the truth about some of these word of faith preachers. And so we put optional videos on there. Uh, some were teachings and preaching uh, from from people 30, 40, 50 years ago, 60, 70 years ago that we have video and audio of, and we put that under there, so avail yourself to that. We learned that sickness is part of the curse that entered because of sin in the past. And we also learned that sickness is part of the curse of the law. And so that was very important. We learned that Jesus is the perfect example of God's feeling about sickness. He hated it. Today, you're gonna see something that I've only noticed one other time. When I brought it up, the people that I brought it up just thought I was crazy. So I quit going down that path. Then I went back and looked deeply again. And I'm like, man, you just can't get around this. It's here. Um, and we'll talk about that, uh, about how Jesus felt about sickness. And there's, you're going to see one of the most radical things that Jesus did to deal with sickness that most people have actually missed it uh, of what he did to deal with death and to deal with sickness. And we're going to learn some things that maybe you've never heard before today about ministering um, to the sick by actually dealing with demons. Uh, a lot of times, you know, I've been having a lot more success since I don't care about what they think. They might be the most, seem to be most spirit-filled Christian. I'll say, come out of them in the name of Jesus, you spirit of infirmity. I'll just speak to them because look, a person who has the Holy Spirit is not possessed by a demon, but that word possessed, as we've learned, maybe I don't know if I've said it in this class or not, but we've, we've said other places, doesn't even really exist in the Bible. That entire phrase, possessed by a devil, is actually only one Greek word. And the word literally means demonized or under the influence of a demon. Anybody that allows it can become under the influence of a demon. So if you have false doctrine concerning healing, you could be under the influence of a spirit of infirmity um, or a spirit of cancer or a spirit of death or whatever. And, and because you don't know it, um, you need somebody to tell that thing to come out in the name of Jesus. It's not that it lives in your spirit and controls you, but um, just like I've talked about many times, when the bug man comes over, I heard this from T.L. Osborne, when he comes over and he sprays for bugs, he doesn't come in and spray you in the face with the poison. No, he comes in your house and he sprays the house. Well, we are the house of where the Holy Spirit dwells and where our spirit dwells, all right? Our body is just our house for where our spirit dwells. So Satan cannot dwell in us, all right, in our spirit, but he can come if we give access into the house. 
and try to oppress us with sickness, disease, depression, anxiety. And we got to tell that thing go in the name of Jesus. Um, if you're a Christian, you don't need somebody else to tell it to go. You can tell it to go. But at the same time, when I'm ministering to the sick, there was a lady who, um, who had um, multiple different lung diseases just a few months ago when I was in California. Multiple different lung diseases, including COPD, asthma, several things. And she had had an attack and almost died. And she had a terrible report that was a terminal report. She came up to the altar. She loves the Lord. She's a Christian, no doubt. But you know what I did? I did something I hadn't done before. I had been studying what I'm going to show you today, that, that sickness comes from the devil. And therefore, I treated it like that. And you know what I did? I took her by the head and I said, in the name of Jesus, you spirit of COPD and infirmity, come out in Jesus' name and loose her lungs. And when I did, she described it as something leaving her body. Something left her body and her lungs cleared up. And by the way, she got, this was on a Wednesday night at Church 212 in California. She got the result back that she was totally healed of COPD. And she had had a really a terminal diagnosis of that. It's gone. She's totally healed. And it's kind of unique because I said, come out. I commanded it to come out. And I'm going to get you to be radical after today that you start dealing with sickness um, by telling the sickness to come out. Um, we were watching last night um, uh, Chosen, and we were watching, and I was really hoping, I didn't know how they would deal with P uh, Peter's mother-in-law. Uh, I didn't know how they would deal with it. But I love the fact that, because the Bible says he rebuked the fever. Now, that's interesting. He rebuked the fever as if it was a demon. He rebuked it. Um, and so I didn't know how they would deal with that. Um, but here's what they did. Jesus took her by the hand in the movie, in the show Chosen, and then he said, um, leave her. And, and you can hear this breeze go through. And, and it gave me chills because I said, that's exactly how I pictured it, uh, that he rebuked the fever just like he's rebuking a spirit. All right. So we're going we're gonna to see about that tonight. But we've learned that um, Jesus treated sickness like an enemy. We're going to see that in the most fantastic way tonight that maybe you've ever seen it before from scripture that Jesus actually treated sickness like an enemy. Because if you're going to deal with sick people and you're going to minister healing, you have to learn how to treat sickness like an enemy. You have to, you have to learn to do the things I'm going to show you tonight. We learned that um, it's possible to open up a door for Satan to attack you with sickness. Uh, open up the door by sin. Open up the door through unbelief. Open up the door through speaking evil things. Um, we gave a number of different things that can open up the door um, uh, to, to the enemy. One of those things is um, it, we talked about the judgment of the Lord um, where, where it says, hey, uh, turn this one over to Satan for a while for the destruction of the flesh so that the soul would be saved in the day of judgment. And so it actually was the mercy of the Lord. Um, but you can give way to the devil to attack you with sickness. And so listen, this is very important. Um, as a recap, when you go to minister to the sick, when you go to minister to them, and let's say that they have, um, they've opened up a door that has allowed that sickness to come in. One of the first things you should do with them is to pray with them to repent and to get things out of their life. It doesn't mean that every sickness is because they have sin in their life. But just pray with them to close every door so that once you rebuke the thing and it leaves, you don't want it to come right back because the door's still open. So have them close every door that may be open without being legalistic. Um, have them close every door. I think it's important that we close every door um, so that he doesn't come back in. We've learned that divine healing is provided in the atonement. And in our live discussion, um, yesterday, we talked about the fact that, um, you know, that we have to start there um, with the atonement. And one guy said he learned and realized in dealing with the sick that he had never prayed that way before. He had gotten people, Brother Stan was talking about how he would get people to say, hey, get in faith. Believe that God can do it. Speak the word over yourself. But you know what he never had done before? He never had prayed on the authority of the atonement before. He had never said, because Jesus died on the cross and raised from the dead, I'm declaring healing for this person. So we learned um, in, a, in a previous session uh, a couple of weeks ago, we learned that the order was atonement and then trumpet and then jubilee blessings, everything being restored. So atonement came when Jesus Christ died upon the cross. But what was the trumpet? The trumpet was the declaring that the atonement has happened. 
And once the declaring happened, the trumpet blew, then there could be the, the blessings of healing and the restoration of all that was lost. Listen closely to this. So many people fail to blow the trumpet of the atonement. All right. They don't go in there preaching the gospel to people when they go to pray for healing. Um, they just deal with healing. They deal with the sick person. And this is why so many fail. Listen closely. I think a lot of people fail to have healing when they minister to the sick because they don't go directly to the atonement as the reason that the person is healed. They don't tell them you were healed because Jesus Christ took away your sickness 2000 years ago. They don't tell them that it was included in the cross. How are they supposed to have faith? I want you to remember what the Bible says, that as Moses lifted up the rod in the desert, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. And in the desert, whoever looked on the rod that was lifted up that represented the cross, what happened? They were healed. They were healed if they'd been bitten by poisonous snakes. You know what that tells me? Jesus said in the same way, I'll be lifted up. You know what? When we look at the cross, when we get people to get their eyes on the fact that Jesus bore their sin, he bore their sickness, he bore their pain, and we focus on that. We're blowing the trumpet of the atonement, and that's the basis on which they get healed. You know, John and I and our, and, and our whole Agape team, we go out, we minister to the sick. We could say, oh, well, we're having greater success here than we've ever had because we're with the unreached, and I've even thought that might be the case at times. But now I no longer think that because I left here and I went to America and I had basically just as many miracles happen, um, just, just, as, just as frequent. There's not one place that we went where healing didn't happen. And, and I mean, some of it was instantly, some of it was the next day. I mean, dramatic miracles and healing. Melanie received a miracle um, and, and we had others that received instantaneous miracles. No different than here. But you know what the difference was? Well, in the past, when I went to deal with people who were sick, I would talk to them about the fact that it's God's will to heal. I would talk to them about the fact that um, God wants them to live and not die. I would go through the promises, but I wasn't taking them back to the simplicity of the atonement of Jesus Christ. I wasn't focusing on that. Well, in, in Thailand and Vietnam and Burma, as we went out, you know what we do? We'd go door to door and we'd say to people, um, you know, we'd like to give you a gift. And, and by the way, can we speak a blessing over you? Uh, while we're here in the name of our God, Jesus Christ. And we get some funny looks, but then about half of them would say, yeah, you can do that. And then we'd say, great, but before we do that, we want to share something with you. And we would give a five to 10 minute presentation of the whole gospel. And so we would declare that everything was perfect, you know, and that Adam's sin, and, and because of his sin, he brought a curse of sin and sickness and disease and all of that on the world but God loved the world so much that he sent Jesus Christ who came and lived the perfect life and then took the sins of the whole world and the sicknesses of the whole world, died, was buried, and then on the third day to prove that he was God and he was sinless, he raised from the dead. And if you believe that message, and a lot of times we would give a testimony with it, and then we would say, if you believe this message, you'll be saved of your sins and healed of your diseases. And, and, and then we'd say, do you believe this message? And they would say, you know, they would often say, yes, I believe that. And we'd say, if you believe that message, you're now a child of God. And therefore, the blessings of God can come on you. Then we would pray, lay our hands on them, rebuke the disease and speak healing. And we had tremendous healings where I stopped counting a very short time. Just a few months in, I stopped counting at 40 verified healings and miracles that had happened in people's lives. Um, why? We were taking them to the cross because they had never heard. So we had to. Well, what I learned is when I went to America is I went ahead and said, believer or unbeliever, I'm going to preach the, the gospel. All right. And, and the healing is going to come to them on the basis of the gospel. And we'll get into more of that just a little bit later. So even as I'm recapping, I want you to think in terms of people receiving healing in your ministry. All right. Even as I'm recapping, because a lot of this leads into that. Um, we, we learned that receiving healing um, is the same way we receive salvation. We receive healing by faith in the atoning work of the cross. So we don't have to make it any different. Tia Osborne tells a story about how he had heard F.F. F. Bothworth say, well, you know, if you had a hundred people and you line them up and you then, they were all unbelievers and you shared the gospel with them. And then you asked them um, if they had faith in Jesus Christ and every one of them had faith in Jesus, how many of them would get saved? 
And of course, the people said, all of them. He said, well, in the same way then, if we had 100 sick people and we lined them up and we preached the gospel that included the fact that Jesus bore sickness and pain and they received that by faith, how many of them should be healed? And he said, well, all of them should. Well, T.L. said, that's not been my experience. So he said, I, I'm going to, but, but, but it looks like the truth. So I'm going to try that out. And so he advertised and he had people in his denomination at the time get mad at him and say, you've lost your mind. You, it's a death sentence. There, nobody's going to go to your church anymore after this uh, because, you know, you're going to have a bunch of people, you know, that, that you're going to pray for that's not going to get it and all of this. And so um, he, he, he brought in a bunch of deaf people. And I don't remember what the number is, but if you listen to much T.L. Osborne, you've heard that story several times. But there was a bunch of people that came that were all deaf. And he said he prayed for them and all except for either three or four were healed. Um, all but three or four. And he told every one of them, the Lord is working in your, in your ears. And when it comes to full fruition, he said, thank God every day that you received it tonight. But when it comes, I want you to come and tell me. And within just about a week to two weeks, um, all but one uh, came and said, I've received. Um, and then within a couple of months, that last one said, I received. There was another time where there were nine lepers that had hid underneath the stage because they weren't even supposed to be there. And they had snuck out of the leper colony where he was preaching. And he knew they were there. He allowed it. And then he said something came over him and he, he boldly said, bring them up here. Even though he knew the police would haul them off and he knew that people would freak out that, that the lepers were right there in the middle of this massive crowd of thousands of people. And he pulled them up on the stage and he said it was such a pitiful sight to see these nine lepers and how awful they looked and he felt so sorry for them. But he laid his hands on each one of them and he rebuked and he commanded the spirit of leprosy. Very important. He said, you spirit of leprosy, come out of them. All right. They had already believed the gospel. They had already become Christians. But then he rebuked the spirit of leprosy. And um, the, the person in charge of this leper colony, which is not really a colony, but more like a hospital that was for them where they were actually locked up, um, began to send letters each time one would get well. One came with just within a month. But within two years, all nine of the lepers had been totally healed. They didn't all get instantaneously healed, but these were incurable lepers who, um, who, who in many cases kept it 10, 12, 15 years, and they would go in remission for a short time, and then it would come back and things like that. But these people within two years were totally cleansed and well. He kept up with them, with them for a very long time to see that they remained well, never went back or anything like that. They were cleansed of their leprosy. So he began to prove that it was as simple as faith. And, and one thing he was learning, and we learned that, and one thing he was learning with this was he thought he had to do all this stuff, like yell at the devil, you know, and lay hands on every single one of them and, and have everybody crowd around and pray in tongues and make a big ruckus, scare the devil off and all that stuff. And then he learned, you know what? It's not about all that. It's just faith in the name of Jesus. The simplicity of believing the gospel message. And as they believe the gospel message, they will be made whole. All right. And we learned that um, we are included in the covenants of promise of the children of Israel. One of those covenant promises, Exodus 15, 26, I am the God that heals you. And we learn that because we are believers, that we are also children of Abraham and included in the promises of the children of Israel in Ephesians chapter two. But we also learned that we have a better covenant established upon better promises. So it's great that we have the old covenant and all the blessings that come with that. But we also have a new covenant that's even better with better promises that include everything the old covenant promises along with everything that the New Testament promises us, the new covenant. Um, and then we learn that Jesus' name represents all the covenant redemptive names of God. And I'm sharing all this with you to remind you of these things because as you begin to minister to the sick, these are the things you've got to know. You've got to always know it is the will of God when you go to pray for the sick. If there is doubt in your heart, does God want to heal this person? You could just forget it. You could forget it. I'm telling you, you've got to go in there knowing God wants to heal that person. Believe in it. Um, you know what? If you don't believe it, they'll know you don't believe it. And you know what? To get somebody else in faith with you, you really got to believe what you're talking to them about. And so it's good for you to know it's God's will. It's good for you to know the name of Jesus encompasses all of the covenant rights and privileges when you use that name against a sickness or, or a disease. We learned that Jesus was anointed to proclaim the perpetual year of Jubilee, that now that he's come forever, it is always Jubilee. 
Everything the devil has stolen, your health, your finances, your joy, your peace, your marriage, all of those things have to be returned to your life because Jesus said that it is the favorable year of the Lord that he came to declare. And uh, we learned that healing comes in many different ways. We learned that there's many hindrances to healing. And then we also finally learn that we can't focus too much on avoiding the hindrances to healing and on looking at the ways to be healed, but focus on Jesus and let his grace cover us. That we don't need to become legalistic about trying so hard to get our healing. Because we see we can try so hard and check all the boxes. Okay, I've, I've done all these things that I'm supposed to do to get healed, and I've avoided all these things I'm supposed to avoid. Where's my healing at? And you've got yourself wrapped up in focusing on trying to be healed instead of looking at the Redeemer and getting your eyes on the atonement and on the one that does the healing. And so I think that's very, very powerful. Um, and so now we're going to talk about ministering to the sick. And one of my very favorite um, heroes of the faith is John G. Lake. If you get a chance, uh, make sure that you get, there's a couple of books. One is called God's General by Robert Slaridan. Uh, he doesn't write anything in it. He just compiled all the sermons and, and the journal entries and um, different things from John G. Lake's life, his life story, other things like that. Another one is called His Life, His Sermons, um, and His Miracles and His Faith. I uh, saw so John G. Lake, His Life, Sermons, Miracles, and Faith. Um, both of them are fantastic. They're full of actual letters that people sent him after being healed and different things. But John G. Lake was neighbors with F.F. F. Bosworth. And I love this spiritual heritage because I have a spiritual heritage. I do. I have a personal spiritual heritage with uh, T.L. Osborne. All right. He was an older man of God in his late 60s, early 70s. I was five years old um, and uh, he laid his hands upon me. His grandson prayed for me to receive the Holy Spirit at five years old. And just a couple of years ago, we preached the gospel together. But his spiritual mentor was F.F. F. Bosworth who wrote Christ the Healer, one of the most well-known books on healing there ever was. F.F. F. Bosworth traveled together with T.L. Osborne. And T.L. Osborne was um, about 25. F.F. F. Bosworth was about 75. Well, F.F. F. Bosworth was neighbors with John G. Lake, and they lived together at uh, Zion, Illinois, with John Alexander Dowie. Now, we know that John Alexander, Alexander Dowie, at the end of his life, got into error. But it doesn't negate all of the great things he did and all of the good, sound teaching that he had for a long time, uh, just like any of us. Um, you know, my dad said he used, to be, he used to be so puzzled when he heard this one man of God pray because this guy would pray and he would say, Lord, don't give me so much of your glory that I fall off the wagon. And he would say, you know, why would he pray, God, don't, don't give me glory. Don't give me so much glory. You know, most of us want, God, give me all you got. You know, I want it all. But this was an older man of God who had seen people who had received so much of God's glory, but they didn't check themselves. And just like we saw with Paul, who said, look, I, I was full of revelation, but I began to be conceited. And so that I wouldn't be lifted up in pride, there was given unto me a, a, a messenger of Satan to buffet my life. And so we don't want that, right? And so we've got to be careful. So um, uh, John Alexander Dowie was one of the greatest evangelists of his time in the 1800s. Now, he didn't understand the truth of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but he did understand divine healing. And people like F.F. F. Bosworth, Maria Woodworth Eder, um, and John G. Lake, and a host of great people who ministered healing, uh, who really knew a lot about praying for the sick that we learn from today um, when we look back. They were, they were neighbors. John G. Lake has an incredible story, and I want you to hear this unbelievable story. Some of you in the live discussion with the American one, some of you heard part of this, some of you heard this, but it's worth repeating for everybody because everyone needs to hear this. John G. Lake was desperate. He had eight brothers and sisters who died of illnesses. They all died before the age of 25. They all died as young people. He had been surrounded by death. I want to say there was either 12 or 13 of them in total. Eight of them had died. They were dropping like flies of tuberculosis and other kinds of things that were just taking them out. He lived from 1870 to 1935. And so he was having all these people die. He was in his early 20s or so, and he became desperate. He began to search out what the Bible says. He said, this can't be the will of God. This just can't be. There's got to be something more. He heard about Zion, Illinois. He heard about the healing houses 
that later he himself would make famous. But he heard that you could go to Zion, Illinois. There was no medicine allowed there at uh, John Alexander Dowie's ministry. You lived in houses on the plantation there. You were in the Word seven days a week. He stayed with the people that were sick all day long. He would have prayer partners pray over them 24 hours a day until they got well. They didn't leave until the person was healed. All right, now this is very important for you to hear. You know, in, in, in Bhutan, they, they have healing rooms and they'll keep people seven days, eight days, you know, whatever, till they get healed. Uh, and, and, and I think there's something to that. I think there's something to that uh, that we should do today. But that's what they would do. They would keep people and pray for them. Well, John G. Lake, and this is one of the most powerful stories that you need to hear if you're going to minister divine healing that I've ever heard. Eight brothers and sisters who died. All right. John G. Lake takes his brother who's still alive that's an invalid. Now listen to this. Had been an invalid for 22 years. Not spoken, not moved, had to have his diaper changed, had to be turned in the bed, a total invalid, unable to speak or care for himself for 22 years. Now you got to understand, eight were dead. One brother was an invalid for 22 years. Another sister had breast cancer five times. And the doctor finally, after doing surgery on her five times, sewed her up and said, you're eat up with cancer. You're going to have to go home and die. There's nothing else we can do. Sent her home to die. His wife was also dying um, uh, of an illness. And so he went to Zion, Illinois with the four of them. So it was him, his wife who was dying, his invalid brother, and his sister who was eat it with cancer. And he began to learn the principles that you have been learning. It's the will of God to heal. That it's the devil that brings sickness. That God's will is to always heal. That we've got to lay hands on the sick. That we've got to treat sickness like an enemy. He was learning these things for the first time in his life. And guess what happened? Within just a few weeks of being there, his wife was totally healed. Within days of her being healed, the invalid, husband, uh, uh, invalid brother just got up one morning. One morning, he just got up, walked in as if nothing had happened the last 22 years, and just walked in and said, hey, guys, you know, and they were just, what is going on? And they began to have a full conversation as if he had never been ill. And it's like he had gone to sleep and woke up 22 years later, totally healed. And then his sister had been totally healed of cancer. Now, they'd been there about, um, they had been healed for about a three-week time frame. They'd been there for a few months being ministered to before they were all healed. Um, and then they'd been healed for about three weeks, but staying there to learn how to minister to the sick when he got a telegram. A telegram that his sister was, another sister, had fallen ill. See, it was like a curse on their family. And the telegram was from his mom, and it said, Come home quickly if you want to see your sister alive and say your goodbyes. And so he immediately uh, took the family, and he was on his way home, and he began to cry out to God. And he said, God, this is not right. He said, I'm just starting to get this reality that you're a healer. I'm, I was going to go back and begin to show this to my family who's lost so many and lost so much. Lord, three family members have already been healed. And I was going to share this gospel with her and with my mom and with my dad who are elderly now. And I was going to begin to teach this. And, and you got to let me get there in time to pray for my sister and to teach her what I've been learning. And, and so when he gets there, the mom met him at the door and said, John, I'm sorry, you're too late. She's passed away. And he just couldn't believe it because he said his spirit, he said, he said he felt like it, his spirit had grabbed the hold of her spirit and wasn't going to let her go. So he walked in the room and he had to see for himself. And he walked in the room and of course she was very cold and had been dead for several hours at this point. Um, he still checked her pulse, put his hand on her heart, put his hand on her neck, checked for any signs of life, even put a mirror up to her mouth in case there was a tiny bit of breathing he couldn't see. He was just looking for any, because he just felt in his heart, she's not going to die. But, but she was gone. Um, and she ended up being dead for almost an entire day. And one of the most in, uh, miraculous things that launched his ministry happened next. And that's when he was walking up and down saying, God, this ain't right. Now, this isn't right. I really believed I was supposed to show her the gospel of healing. And, and, and she was going to be healed, but she died before I got here. This is not right. All right. And he was looking for one person to agree with him, <clears throat> to agree with him in prayer, that she could be raised from the dead. But nobody was willing to do that. People just, they just didn't, didn't have it in them to do it. 
So he sent a telegram. This is just ridiculous. And there's copies of the real telegram inside the book. Um, the actual copy of the telegram where he sends a telegram and he, he just said very simply, it wasn't like a fax machine. You could say a bunch of stuff. He just said a few words. My sister has died. Please pray for me. I will not let her go. Thank you, John. All right. He gets back uh, a telegraph almost immediately. Said, and it says this from John Alexander Dowie. I am praying. Hold on to your faith. She will live. He said when that happened, it was like lightnings begin to just go off in his spirit. That's what he described. Lightnings in his spirit just begin to go off. And he said he believed that word. She will live. I am going to hold on and we're going to agree in faith together. He's praying. I'm praying. We're believing God for this thing. And he said the lightnings of God begin to come. And he walked over there. He put his hands on her feet. And he said, I rebuke the spirit of death. I said, you, I said, you spirit of death, come out of her in the name of Jesus. Go out of here and don't you ever come back from here. He said, then he presently went and sat down in the corner of the room. His father and mother were on the ground crying and weeping at her death. The, the brother-in-law was, uh, was on another chair beside her crying. He said he sat down and just watched her to see what would happen. He said he thought he saw her eyes move. But then he said, maybe I'm just too excited, you know. But one thing that, I, that jumped out at me is he said, what he thought later, what if I'd have got a telegram that said, you know, brother, it's just God's, it's just not God's will to heal, or it was just her time to go, or, you know, brother, uh, you're just a little too excited. Or he said, what if they would have sent me a telegram back that said, you know, um, you, you need to, you need, it was her time to, God needed somebody else to help him with his flower bed in heaven, or any number of things that, that could have been sent back. But instead the telegram said, I'm holding on, I'm praying with you. Um, she will live. And, and so in that agreement, the, he kept calling it the lightnings of God went off inside him. He said he thought he saw her eyes move, but he didn't want to get up and be rude. He, say, he kept sitting there watching her when suddenly he saw the brother-in-law get up and, and go take a close look. And he said to the brother-in-law, did you see her eyes move? And he said, I did. I think I saw her eyes move. Suddenly her eyes moved again. And that's when John G. Lake jumped up and began to thank the Lord. And just a few minutes later, her hands began to tingle, her feet began to tingle, and breath came into her body. And his testimony, along with everyone who was in that room, multiple letters from multiple people, said that by five days later, that was on December 20th, on Christmas Day, for the first time in the Lake family, every single living family member was healed and whole, including the one who had died. And they sat around and thanked God over Christmas dinner everybody being healed. This launched John G. Lake into the healing ministry. When he began to say, I've seen now four people in my family dramatically healed simply by believing what God's word says, that it is always God's will to heal, to rebuke the sickness as if it is an enemy, all right? As if it's a devil itself to rebuke that enemy. And uh, I want to say this prayer can sometimes be as simple as decreeing a thing in the presence of God. And I'm going to show you that. Um, we see very specifically this thing that, that sometimes you will pray and in the presence of Almighty God, you will then decree something and it will happen. And that is a type of prayer, a prayer of faith, a decreeing or declaring of something. We're going to show you biblical proof of that. Um, but at the same time, we're going to respect our time in this first class. I want you to see in John chapter 11 and in the second class, we're going to look at a lot of scripture here. John chapter 11, I want you to see the most crazy thing. I told you I was, going to, I was going to tell you about something that you've probably never noticed before. And when I first showed this to somebody, they said, well, I don't know about that. Um, but I found it, and I know it to be true. I know it's here. And it's in the book of John chapter 11, and it's the way Jesus dealt with the spirit of death. And it was very, very similar. But I never saw it before until I looked it up in the Greek. Uh, and it blew me away. Blew me away. How Jesus dealt. Now, we've got to, got to see this. He actually dealt with the spirit in the spirit realm to himself before he ever went to the tomb and called forth the brother, uh, his friend, Lazarus. Um, and so here's what it says in John chapter 11, um, which is just amazing. They were all murmuring. And they were saying, you know, um, if Jesus would have been here on time, if he'd have just been here on time, you know, this guy wouldn't have died. But he was late. 
All right, well, Jesus says this. In verse 17, it says, So Jesus came, and he found that he had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. Many of the Jews had joined the women around Mary and Martha to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Martha said, Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know whatever you ask God for, God will give it. Did you hear her declaration of faith? She said, he's dead. He wouldn't have died if you'd have been here. But even now, God will raise him up. Even now, if you ask him to. Uh, that was her faith. That's what she said. Even now. And then this is what Jesus said to her. Your brother will rise again. Jesus, what did he do? He made a declaration of faith. Martha said, I know that he'll rise on the resurrection day of the last day. Jesus basically says, you don't, I'm not talking about that. He said, I am the resurrection and I am the life. And he that believes in me, though he die, he shall live. Whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? What was he doing? Getting her to get in faith with him. She said, yes, Lord, I believe you are the Christ, the son of God who is coming to the world. Hallelujah. Those were words of faith in who Jesus was. You could say that she was looking to the atonement. She was looking to that sent one who came to die and to deliver us from the power of death. And then when, um, she had, uh, when she had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary to her, to her sister. The teacher has come and is calling for you. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came. Now Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. Then the Jews who were with her in the house, comforting her, when they saw Mary rose up quickly and went out, they followed her, saying, She is going to the tomb to weep there. Then, when Mary had come to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Same thing as her sister said. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her weeping, listen to these words, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And said, where have you laid him? Now, now remember that phrase, groaned in the spirit. Um, they said, come and see, Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him? Some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept him from dying? Then Jesus, watch this, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was on it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the, the sister who was, uh, excuse me, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there's a stench. He's been dead four days. Jesus said, did I not say to you, if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? He's in a frustrated move at this point. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was laying. Jesus lifted up his eyes. Now here's where he's going to pray and make a decree while he's in the presence of God. Father, I thank you that you hear me. I know that you always heard me, but because of the people that are standing here, I said this, so that they may believe you sent me. Now when he said this thing, he said in a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. So there was nothing really in the middle between those two. He prayed, God, I'm praying. I know you always hear me, but for their sake, I'm saying this. Then he screamed, Lazarus, come forth. So in the middle of a prayer, to God, he turns and makes a decree in the presence of God. Uh, and of course, he came forth bound hand and foot. Now, this is what I never saw. Two times he groaned in his spirit. One time it said he groaned within himself. The other time it said he groaned in his spirit. You guys, do you know what that word groaned means? Unbelievable. The word means to grunt with anger. It means to have indignation upon, to blame it means to sigh with a chagrin. It means to sternly instruct someone to do something. <laughs> it means to straightway charge them. It means, listen to this, it means to murmur against someone or something. To murmur against someone or something. It means to charge with an earnest admonition. Listen to this. It means to threaten to tell someone to do something they don't want to do. <laughs> It means to be moved with anger, to be very angry. All right, when you look at this in the Greek Septuagint, the word, the word carries the meaning 
of expressing, this is unbelievable, violent displeasure within oneself. So the, the word literally means to, 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 to have a, a violent displeasure that you express basically within your own self. And listen to this. It's used two times here in John, but it's used three times outside of John, but outside of this story. It's used three times. It gives the idea, kind of like this is the way I wrote it, the way I saw it, of when you see a mama pull a boy aside that's acting up in Walmart and just tells them off and says, you do that one more time, I'm going to tear you up, you know, and pulls them in the hallway and just kind of tells them off in a, in a quiet voice, but everybody knows what's up and she's telling him, let me tell you something, young man, you better not do that again. It's kind of like that. That's what's happening. Um, it's basically a, a powwow that sets someone straight, all right, and tells them how it's going to be. And so this is what Jesus did two times on the way to the grave. He was violently angry, and he expressed it with a grunt, or another translation, another word says to snort with anger and indignation. And so literally, he snorted with indignation against what? What was he? Was he mad at God? Was he groaning within himself against God? Because listen, it says to blame. <laughs> it says to sigh with a chagrin and sternly instruct, straightly charge and, and bring it, basically murmur against something. What was he murmuring against? He was murmuring against his enemy, his mortal enemy, death. The Bible says the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. He was showing him, I got the power over you, buddy. And let me tell you what he did. In his spirit, on the inside, before he even dealt with the situation or even said a word or even prayed a prayer, you know what he did? He murmured in his spirit against the enemy. He brought a violent warfare against that enemy in his spirit. So within his heart, all right, it even says it, that he, he groaned. It was almost like he made a little noise as he's, oh, let me tell you something, you know, that kind of thing. He groaned on the inside with anger. He had great indignation. And this is important because he was about to deal with what probably was the greatest miracle in his ministry. He was about to deal with it right here. And on his way, you know what he had to do? He had to get angry with this thing. And I want to tell you something. If you want to see miracles in your ministry, and we're going to go through a, a bunch of examples in the Bible so that we can put ourselves in their position and say, okay, this is how you deal with this thing and this is how you deal with that thing. I think the way you position yourself is the most important thing. That you look at that thing and say, this is an enemy. And as you prepare yourself to go deal with a cancer patient, as you prepare yourself to go deal with somebody who is dying of kidney failure, as you prepare yourself to go to a sick bed where somebody's about to leave this world, all right, you go there and within your own spirit, you have a righteous indignation against that spirit of sickness, against that spirit of death, that wants to kill them and take them out before the time. And you can't go in there, manby-pamby, you know. You can't go in there and say, well, you know, if it's the Lord's will, you know, or he may decide he wants to take you to heaven today, or, you know, whatever. God wins either way. He might heal you by taking you to heaven, or he might, you know, heal you another way. No, you got to go in there already having dealt in your spirit that this, this devil is defeated. I'm going in there to rip his head off. I'm going in there to destroy the power of this thing. And in your spirit, you've already determined this enemy is going down. And when I get there, I'm going to speak the words necessary to deal with it. And you could see that Jesus had righteous indignation because he said to her when she said, he would have lived, he would have lived. He said, didn't I tell you? Didn't I tell you you're going to see these wonderful things, didn't I tell you, to believe and to agree with me? Didn't I tell you this? You know? And then he says, roll away that stone. And then he prayed to God. And then with a loud voice, he said, Lazarus, come forth. And I think we see here a great pattern that we're going to use as we look at different examples of people and how apostles and how Jesus ministered to the sick, because that's how we have to minister to the sick as well. I think it's important that number one, we have righteous indignation against the enemy, and we see that this is totally an enemy. We can't look at it as anything else but an enemy, all right? Secondly, I think it's always good to pray, but notice he wasn't praying for her healing. He was praying, in this instance, he was praying um, so that the people would know 
that he was getting the power from God. But in our uh, position, we pray because we were, we're saying, Lord, I thank you that you've empowered me. You've given me the authority. And I thank you that you're going to hear me when I speak to this thing. And then the third thing he did, so the first thing he did was decide in his heart with righteous indignation, this thing ain't going to live. It ain't going to work. The spirit of death's not going to win. That's the first thing. Second thing is he gave glory and honor and prayed to God. The third thing is, was not a prayer necessarily. It was in the presence of God, but he spoke the words and he said, come forth. And I think many times we don't receive healing because we're asking God to do something he already did. Jesus healed 2,000 years ago. We don't need to ask him for healing in that sense. We need to thank him that he healed us at the cross 2,000 years ago, and we need to attack the sickness with the authority of the name of Jesus. We're going to come back, pick up where we left off, and talk in depth about specifically dealing with sickness and disease through the laying on of hands, through rebuking, through anointing with oil, and all of these ways, and it's going to be good. God bless you.